orient our lives to Jesus Christ, to focus on Him, to repent of our sins, habits and patterns that have led us astray. It's a time to renew our faith, a coming back, a returning to the Lord. I read these words this week by another Anglican pastor. He said, new life springs forth from dead seeds. Limbs stripped of their leaves bring forth new leaves every spring. So it needs to be said this morning that Lent is about dying. But it also needs to be said that Lent is about asking God to bring about new life in us. We are a people who have died with the Lord Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism and have been raised with him to newness of life. That's not just a one-time occurrence, but beginning there continues throughout our lives. When we fast, it is about desires and impulses dying in us to make room for new life. When we give something up, it is to make room for something else, something better, something good, something life-giving. What can we discover about ourselves during the season of Lent? What can we discover about God during Lent? I've chosen this morning as my text Psalm 51, which obviously is not the psalm that we read this morning. But Psalm 51 is indeed the psalm for Ash Wednesday that we read together this week. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 51. Lent can be a time for us, a time of restoration. Listen to me. For many of us, life has become hard. Life has become weighty, almost too heavy to bear. For some, life is now dominated with sadness and despair. We've talked a lot about hope this year already, and I want to continue that theme this morning. I want us, every man, woman, and child in this church, to rediscover genuine joy that is ours in Jesus Christ. My prayer for us is that this Lent, God will restore joy in our lives. When David wrote the 51st Psalm, David was probably at the lowest point of his entire life. He had lost his joy. He was despondent. He was depressed. There is, in the first part of this psalm, a sadness that is almost palatable. But what I want you to hear this morning is this. I believe David rediscovered his joy. The place we begin is where David began. We recognize that sin separates us from God and restoration is in him. Now, if you're astute, and I know you are, I'm going to ask the question that some of you are already asking. Gene, didn't Paul write in Romans 8, For I am sure that neither life nor death nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the answer is yes, he wrote those words. What I can tell you this morning is this. Nothing 
can ever separate us from the love of God. But our sin can absolutely break our fellowship with Him. Sin changes the way we see ourselves. Sin changes the way we see God. Sin can be devastating to the soul. David knew God. God had even said about David, you are a man after my own heart. But what I know is that David, this man after God's own heart, committed adultery and murder and his fellowship with God was broken. All you have to do is read the first five or six verses of this psalm to know David was despondent. This morning, if you are in darkness and despair, I challenge you to wrestle with sin in your heart that you have not dealt with. It is easy for us to blame somebody else for our stuff. But for most of us, the first place we need to look is in our own hearts. I've said this before, you've heard it before. Sin never delivers what it promises. Sin is the great deceiver. When we compromise and allow sin to take root in our lives, then the natural spiritual outcome is broken fellowship with God and a dark, weighty separation. Sometimes, if you're like me, your natural temptation is just to take our sin and run away from God. But I want you to see something this morning. David did just the opposite. Psalm 51.1 Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. David asked God for mercy. David asked for mercy that is born out of God's love for him. God loves you this morning and is ready to give you mercy if you'll ask for it. Wash me and cleanse me. Take this sin that I can't get away from away from me. It is always with me and it is literally driving me crazy. I can't deal with it any longer. Please take it away. Lord, I know I've sinned against others, but most of all, my sin is against you. You would be justified in anything that you did to me, but I appeal for your mercy. If you want to deal with the darkness that sin brings to your life, run to God. Drop everything you've got. Run as fast as you can. Whatever you do, make your way to God. When Thomas Hooker was on his deathbed, Thomas Hooker was the great Puritan leader who was also the founder of the colony of Connecticut. When he was dying, one of those sitting next to his bed said to Thomas, well, it looks like you're going to receive the rewards of your labor. He replied, no, I'm going to receive mercy. I'm going to receive mercy. We serve a God who wants to pour his mercy upon us. 
That's what he wants for us. The wonderful thing about being in Christ is that he's not stingy with his mercy. He will lavish it on those who ask for it. But we don't stop there. See, sin separates, but truth cleanses. David began by being honest with God. Lord, I am a huge sinner, and I desperately need your mercy. And then look in verse 6. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. God wants us to be truth, true in our hearts. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. You wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David owns the sin of his heart. He knows that in doing so, God will wipe his heart clean. The work that God wants to do in us is a work of the heart. He wants our hearts to be honest about what's happening inside. The cry of our lives must be to God. I watch bits and pieces of these debates and the folly of it all. Please, don't look to politicians for your salvation. Your salvation is in God. Please forgive me and cleanse me. Lord, make me new again. I'm so tired of living in the darkness. I want to live in the light of your love and your mercy. When God cleanses our hearts, the joy returns. When God does the work, the joy will return. David says in verse 8, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. As David pours out his heart to God, the tone of the psalm shifts. We begin to see, I believe, some of the joy returning. Our God is faithful. Look at the words that, that now fill this psalm. Joy, gladness, rejoice, clean, renew, restore, joy, salvation. Dear church, there is no joy without God. David said in the 16th Psalm, you make known to me the path of life in your presence. Where? In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Our joy is found in the presence of of a holy God. When we talk about spending time with God, it's not to check it off our list to make Him think better of us. We spend time with God because that's where the joy comes from. When we remember what Jesus has done for us in saving us, there is great joy. If you really think about it, it's almost unbelievable that our lives could ever be filled with anything but joy. When you think about what has been given to us, Bob Snyder was sharing with me, he, he read a verse in Hebrews this morning that, where it says that Jesus went to the cross with joy. There was joy when Jesus went to the cross for us. It's amazing, isn't it? Wrap your heads around that. When the joy returns, our darkness turns to light. 
This cleansing of the heart produces renewed fruit in our lives. You know, sometimes doubt and depression and despair can grip us so tightly that we are immobilized. We're unable to live life. We're unable to get up in the morning. We're unable to go forward. It's, it's, it can be debilitating. We've all tasted that to some extent or another. What's amazing is that we would ever choose to run away from God instead of into His arms of mercy. That's where the joy is found. Joy turns our darkness into light. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. See, what, what, what David is saying is, if I can get it right with God, then my life all of a sudden can be used of God. There's then this renewed freedom that allows us to share the gospel and live the gospel and see other lives changed as a result. O oh God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Do you see, do you see the shift from the beginning of this psalm where there's deep, dark despondency? David runs to God and God meets him. And what happens is that then David's mouth is filled with praise. And he's able to reestablish purpose in his life. You know the words of this hymn. There is a place of sweet repose from every tide of stormy woes, a calm, steadfast retreat, a shelter from the wind that blows, and where it is, the Christian knows, tis at the mercy seat. A place where joys of life abound, where we may hear the soothing sound of Jesus' voice so sweet, we know because of grace redound, a closer walk with God is found while at the mercy seat. Because of prayer when day is done, or at the early rise of sun, we suffer no defeat. Whene'er we pray through with the sun, how many are the victories won around the mercy seat? As we enter this season of Lent, may Lent be a time when we cast off the darkness of winter and begin to embrace the new life of spring. And may you find fresh mercy this day. And may God restore unto each of us the joy of his salvation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.